Well, good morning everyone. I hope this is all functioning. We've had a few technical hitches, but as long as the technical hitches are overcome by 11 o'clock, that's okay. Um, what an eventful week it has been in the world. Um, a terrorist attack in Vienna. Um, as it happens, my sister was there last year and had ice cream with an Austrian friend in the very street where it happened, which brings it close to home. Um, an election with an unprecedented, this is the year of the unprecedented turnout in the States, and with the result now being challenged by the incumbent president. But I thought I would just be really insular and talk about what it's like in Melbourne this morning. We have brilliant sunshine, maximum of 20, 22 expected, brilliant sunshine, cloudless blue sky, and we are on the ninth day of no COVID infections and no COVID deaths. So are we happy? And as a result, there's been considerable easing of restrictions. And of course, our prayer is that nobody, but nobody will think this means COVID's gone away, that we'll all remember it's just got the lid on it at the moment, and we should do all we can to keep it that way. But for every Victorian, there'll be some good news in there. Churches, we're waiting. We're allowed 20 indoors. We're waiting till that's further eased. Um, but we are thankful, and I was particularly thankful to learn how many people are still coming forward to be tested. I worried that the low infection numbers meant low inf testing numbers, but no. So, to all of you who are doing it so much tougher, our hearts and our prayers go out to you. But today, we are just as Melburnians, as Victorians, so grateful for where we've reached. God bless us all. Thank you, Christine. Nice to have a reminder of that good news right here in Melbourne. And of course, uh, we're going to share the best of news. That's what we come to church for, the best of news, the good news of the gospel. Welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church, and thank you for joining us. This, uh, it's November the 8th, and it's just amazing how this year has passed. Right? Christine's alluded to a number of things that have been going on in the wider world, and of course we all look at it from where we are located, uh, and in this case through a screen. We hope and pray that things are working well where you are. We have the usual components in our service. There'll be some music to listen and settle us listen to and settle. Uh, uh, that'll be uh, played by Amanda shortly. Uh, we'll uh, have a Bible reading. Christine will bring something to us for young at heart. And uh, we're con this is our 14th uh, great text of the Bible. I've got really sucked in by, <laughs> by this sequence and I'm going to have to draw it to a close uh, as Advent draws near, but we'll take it to Advent. So I'd like to invite you to join with me in prayer as we commence our service. Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before you, grateful that you have slipped into world history a message of good news for every generation and people of every place. We ask that the message that you have given us will be transmitted not just uh, widely, uh, but in time, uh, enduringly, so that the name of Jesus is lifted up. As people draw to him, we pray that your spirit will uh, convey the loving presence and power of the Lord Jesus to every heart. And we ask that you, as the Father of lights, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its true identity, might be honored in human society, wherever uh, it engages with the culture of men and women, we ask your blessing today, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said Amanda would play to us, uh, play for us, and she has uh, sent this uh, uh, section from uh, J.S. Bach and Dante, and uh, like to to settle and 
uh, be still and enjoy this piece from Amanda. Well, that was beautiful, Amanda, and just lovely to see you looking at the camera for a moment. Um, be good to see you without the need for a camera. Well, this past week, because we'd already had some easing of restrictions, I had the joy of catching up with four dear friends on two separate occasions, two on each. Our friendships have survived two lockdowns more than intact, and for that I'm very grateful. The two reunions did involve some confession time. I confessed that I have not tidied every drawer nor every shelf. I have not learned another language nor learned to play an instrument well. As we ate lunch on our deck recently, we had a couple of lovely days where it was warm and we could sit outside, I noticed that the fence around the deck needed repainting, something we're both capable of doing. Also, that the floor needed resealing. I asked myself, why did I not notice this in March? Anyway, this morning my confession is that I often find it difficult to decide what to talk on. Sometimes I don't, I just have something happens during the week and I think, wow, I want to share that. But despite, even the weeks where I struggle, every week at least one person gets in touch to say that my words have helped them. So thank you to all for the encouragement and remember too that where things don't work, like where you can't hear, we need to know that too. My last confession for today is when people say, well, what are your plans for Christmas? I say, nothing is planned yet. However, in my phone, I have a list of all the grandchildren and present ideas for a few of them. Three 
gifts in total have been purchased. And one gift has inspired this talk. And I'll show you that in a moment. This time last year, large swathes of Eastern Australia were being already being ravaged by bushfires, and some, I think, had the fires start in September. The damage was almost inestimable, although I think now the price has been estimated. Just as during the pandemic in Australia, so during bushfires, saving human lives is always the first priority, is always paramount. Wherever it is safe to do so, firefighters also do all they can to save properties. And it's mostly in the aftermath that myriads of volunteers come forward and go looking for injured wildlife. Native Australian animals are very skilled at coping with bushfires, something I just marvel at every time, the wonder of creation, that these animals know where to go to be safe. But the increasing intensity and extent of the fires mean that many do not survive. Koalas, for example, try to climb to the tops of trees. That's okay until the whole tree burns or explodes and sometimes we have fires which spread from treetop to treetop. There are many sites on the internet listing the strategies of different animals and on the notes for this talk you'll find one such link, but you'll find them easily yourself. Um, now, we have a photograph from that site, but, uh, yep, it's coming now. Um, this is obviously a reptile which has been rescued. And if the topic interests you, you'll also find on the internet many heartwarming stories of rescues. For today, today's talk, I'm drawing exclusively on the book I have purchased. Not sure whether that shows, but Graham's going to put across a photo of the cover for our youngest grandchild. I don't know what I'll do. Well, I know other people with young children because some children's books just seem to see it all. It's called Fire Wombat. And it's written by the very productive and successful author Jackie French and beautifully illustrated by Danny Snell. I would love to read the whole book and show the pictures as I remember Justine Clark and others used to do on play school and still probably do. And you often see kindergarten teachers and even prep teachers doing it. But that would be indulgent. However, I am going to court. Echidnas scratched dirt all around, the only safety underground. That was where the wombat fled. Others followed where she led to ancient tunnels cool and deep where even bushfire's breath can't creep. And eventually... Lady Wombat, Fire Wombat, is forced to emerge to look for water, but finds only a stone dry creek. So then she goes back to sleep. If we could have the next slide, thank you. Heads on paws, she closed her eyes under the Southern Cross awoke to crashing from the skies and found her nose near drinking water, dried grass, roots and other fodder. And for anyone not used to bushfires, the crashing from the skies is the noise of the helicopter that's bringing water. But finally, and better than any helicopter as long as it doesn't cause landslides. Now the weeping sky gave rain, 
sweeping off black fire steam, the monster's heat and all its slaughter, defeated by the power of water. Again and again in the Bible, and I've mentioned them before, we find references to animals, sometimes as metaphors for the human condition. For example, the first verse of Psalm 42, As a deer longs for a stream of cool water, so I long for you, O God. I think in a previous talk I mentioned the significance of Noah's ark being a refuge, not just for Noah and his, anim- his family, but also for pairs of animals, so that the species would not die out. And finally, one of my favourite verses from a psalm which Graham and I sang often in our youth. As you, many of you know, we started our Christian journey in a denomination which only sang psalms. This is Psalm 84, verse 3. Even the sparrows have built a nest, and the swallows have their own home. They keep their young near your altars, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. May we all find refuge in God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Christine, especially for that reference to Psalm 84. But now we're going to turn to the New Testament, and our Bible reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the great text that I want to direct you to today is the two chapters, chapters 8 and 9. I'm just going to read the first 15 verses of chapter 8, and then we'll look at chapter 9 verse 15, the very last verse of that chapter. This is uh, an appeal by the Apostle to the Corinthians to give generously uh, for the cause of the uh, Jewish believers in Jerusalem who were in particular need at this time. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know what God's grace has accomplished in the churches of Macedonia. They have been severely tested by the troubles they went through, but their joy was so great that they were extremely generous in their giving, even though they are very poor. I can assure you that they gave as much as they could, and even more than they could. Of their own free will, they begged and pleaded us for the privilege of having a part in helping God's people in Judea. It was more than we could have hoped for. First they gave themselves to the Lord, and then by God's will they gave themselves to us as well. So we urge Titus, who began this work, to continue it and help you complete the special service of love. You are so rich in all you have, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in your eagerness to help, and in your love for us. And so we want you to be generous also in this service of love. I'm not laying down any rules, but I'm showing you how eager others are to help, and I'm trying to help you find out how real your own love is. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he, became, he made himself poor for your sake in order to make you rich through his poverty. My opinion is that it's better for you to finish now what you began last year. You were the first, not only to act, but also to be willing to act. On with it then, and finish the job. Be as eager to finish as you were to plan it, and do it with what you have now. If you are eager to give, God will accept your gift, not on the basis of what you have to give, Sorry, on the basis of what you have to give, not on the basis of what you haven't. I'm not trying to relieve others by putting a burden on you, but since you have plenty at this time, it is only fair that you should help those who are in need. Then when you are in need and they have plenty, they will help you. In this way, both are treated equally. As the scripture says, 
Those who gathered much did not have too much, and those who gathered little did not have too little. And the Apostle continues through chapter 9 with a series of other arguments uh, why generosity on the behalf of the Corinthians is commendable. And he closes in verse 15 of chapter 9 by saying, And so with deep affection, others will pray for you because of the extraordinary grace God has shown you. Let us thank God for his priceless gift. Let us thank God for his priceless gift. And that is the, the uh, particular verse that I want to focus on this morning. So we're at great texts of the Bible, and we're at uh, number 14, and it's in particular this verse, uh, 8 and 9. And I'm using the uh, expression from the authorized version. Uh, the one I've just read is from the uh, Good News Bible, and it says, let us thank God for his priceless gift. But the authorized version, which was where I first learned it, was... Let us thank God for his, un thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. So that's uh, a phrase that I want to work with. And you can see that the whole passage is about generosity. And I've used this icon of the hands shaping a heart because it's the practice that demonstrates what's in the heart. And so generosity is, is a, our theme today. In this section of his letter, the apostle is urging generosity. And I'm using um, some headings by a renowned Glasgow-born uh, preacher in uh, the 19th century who was uh, quite renowned for his ministry, Baptist ministry. Uh, and his name is Alexander McLaren. And he uses three headings. And the first is unspeakable love. And the second is unspeakable sacrifice and the third is unspeakable results so I'm hoping with these three headings we'll be able to pull together some of the key ideas that the apostle is laying before the Corinthians and uh, and I want you to notice as you read through these I'm encouraging you to read it through with a pencil in hand and uh, make note of the use of uh, his arguments, what, he's, what are the reasons he's suggesting. And notice too the word grace. There's a, quite a concentration of that word grace here. It's a key Christian uh, virtue and concept that uh, we want to think about. So firstly, let's think about unspeakable love. These two chapters are dense, as I say, with this word which variously means kindness, favor, generosity. It's the kind of disposition to be encouraged in believing people for several reasons, which are detailed in the argument and which I've invited you to look through with a pencil and just mark, maybe underline in your Bible. Although we don't have the words of Jesus uh, in the Gospels, which say it is more blessed to give than to receive, if you were with us last week, you might remember that the Apostle Paul had said to the Ephesian elders how Jesus had said this, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. A good reminder to us that not everything Jesus said and did is recorded in the Gospels. In fact, John tells us in his Gospel, if everything was to be, to be said, the whole world couldn't contain the books that should be written. Nowadays, we hear repeatedly in the world of philanthropy, that people are surprised to discover how much personal benefit they gain by being generous, as if it was an unexpected discovery. You'll find YouTube clips which uh, depict people, uh, wealthy people being generous, or even just people doing what they can. There's a lovely series of clips about uh, a barber who, who uh, gives haircuts to homeless men, and it, it just thrills him that he can make such a difference to men who have become bedraggled and let themselves go. Uh, just that sense that giving gives something to the giver. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We live in a world, of course, where we put the love of ourselves first so easily. The worship of self is our, is our, perhaps our primary 
idolatry. It's very hard to get beyond ourselves. We need to remind ourselves that a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. Carly Simon uh, is a singer some of you might have heard of. She, uh, she's same age as me and Christine, so she's uh, uh, not telling you how old that is today, but there she are. She's, this is an early picture of her from the innumerable pictures of her on the internet. And she had a song which became famous and has been uh, sung by many, many different people called You're So Vain. And uh, there's a lot of speculation about who she's singing about. And the verse goes like this. You walked into the party like you were walking onto a yacht. Your hat strategically dipped below one eye. Your scarf, it was apricot. You had one eye in the mirror as you watched yourself give out. And all the girls dreamed that you'd be their partner. They'd be your partner and you're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. So, you're so vain. For Christians, generosity is the core of God's char- the character of the God we worship. John tells us that God is love. Selfless love. Love that gives. Love that knows it is more blessed to give. All who have truly loved know that it is the nature of love to give. And so it was and is with God. One of the best known verses in the Bible used to be John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved that he gave. And I've said before from this place that this is a verse not about the size of God's love, not about the quantity of love. It's it's a verse about the quality of God's love. It's easy to love what's lovely and lovable. But what about the unlovely? What about the disfigured or the shameful and the sinful? God's love streams from eternity for the sake of a lost, for the lost and sinful world. Salvation flowed from the heart of God into human history to rescue men and women who have hurt and damaged one another and who couldn't save themselves. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Why should we be so loved? I cannot tell apart from God's love. That is our answer. So that brings us to our second point. The gift involves unspeakable sacrifice. In these two chapters, the first verse that I ever learned was chapter 8, verse 9. You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the kindness. You know the generosity. What did they know? They know that though he was rich, This is uh, going to be a a theme, isn't it, in in the Christmas uh, services as we think about the coming of Christ. He was rich. He dwelt in realms of glory unimaginable to us mortals. From eternity it was always that way. Father, Son and Spirit. uh, in, In one perfect loving unity. We saw it in the hymn that we looked at in Philippians chapter 2 recently. He didn't think it was robbery, as the old version says, to, to, be, to claim equality with God or to hold on to his status as God. But he clothed himself in flesh, became mortal for us and for our salvation. He didn't cling to the prerogatives of deity and power. There was a lost and a wayward world to rescue and to redeem. A world that blamed God for all its woes. Blamed, as you remember from the very early chapters, what's gone wrong in Genesis chapter 3. God, as it were, comes to the man in the garden and the man says, The woman you gave me. And God comes to the woman and the woman says, The snake beguiled me. And so we're putting the blame on another, on someone else. Ultimately, we're saying it's God's fault. It's God's world, and look what he's let it happen to it. 
Who could save us in this situation? What could go wrong? Could it get any worse? Could it get darker? Well, you want it darker is a question asked by 83-year-old Leonard Cohen in his final album, which was released 18 days before he died. Writing as a Jew, his song has been hailed as an enigmatic commentary on Genesis 22, one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. And in that Hebrew chapter, the word hineni occurs three times, and hineni means here I am. All right? Here I am, three times. And in his song, You Want It Darker, Cohen uses the chorus three times. Hineni, hineni. So Leonard Cohen, drawing on his background in the literature of the Hebrew culture, has these words, magnified, sanctified, be thy holy name, vilified, crucified in the human frame, a million candles burning for the help that never came. You want it darker? Hineni, hineni. I'm ready, my Lord. This is a profoundly challenging poem which he sings. Uh, and I don't have a simple explanation of what it all means as I read the words of the whole poem. But it's clear that there's a darkness to humanity that Cohen recognized and that the biblical text takes us into that dark place. And the Christian understanding is that the eternal son entered that dark place, that he came for us to rescue us because we couldn't rescue ourselves. And so for him it involved the incarnation becoming mortal. For him it involved the humiliation. He was derided and spat upon and rejected. And for him it involved an agonizing death. It's been said that the heart of his sorrow was the sorrow of his heart. Remember how he wept over Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers its chickens? It's another of those biblical analogies that Christine was alluding to, the concern for the, all the species of our planet that God has made. How often would I have gathered you, said Jesus, as a, as a hen gathers its chickens, but you would not. So the eternal Son, uh, the Word incarnate, through whom the worlds were made, embraced creatureliness. He inserted himself into his own story. This is the Christian contention. This is what we invite you to consider and to believe. Being born as a human into poverty, to illumine the darkness, born to atone for the wrongs, born to suffer and give. Not money, not first aid, not CPR, but to give himself and to give himself totally. Isaiah and the prophets could see through a glass darkly. The primary story of Abraham anticipates the sacrifice. But who is it who pays to achieve the reconciliation? There's a verse that we read recently in Lamentations. Is it nothing to you or you who pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. My God, my God, cried Jesus on the cross, why have you forsaken me? Who can tell what darkness he fathomed? I cannot. So we move on to the third point. And this is, that, this is a gift that brings unspeakable results. Now, we may be inclined to think, well, this is ancient history. It's unrelated to our 21st century lives. But the Bible says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You'll find it in Colossians chapter 2. And in our sophisticated 21st century, 
We may imagine we've progressed well beyond the teachings of Jesus. Do we need forgiveness? What enormous guilt and suffering has humanity, for all its modernity, etched upon the historic record? The 20th century saw more violent deaths than any other century in human history. It saw the development of weapons of mass destruction. How are we going to move forward with our amazing technology in ways that will help to heal the planet and not to harm and destroy? There's a massive love deficit in our families and in in, in our homes. What about among the family of nations? There is uh, strife and contention and we are advised of it daily in our news feeds. How can personal and global deficits be changed? Well, we do yearn for a love that validates our own loving. And it's the message of Jesus that brings such love to us. It comes with joy and glory unimaginable. I want to show you the uh, St. John's Bible. The man in the middle of this picture, talking to Pope Francis, uh, holding out this massive Bible, this folio edition of the Bible, is called uh, Donald Jackson. Donald Jackson is a calligrapher. He likes writing and he's very good at it. He's the calligrapher to the royal household in the United Kingdom, to the royal office. And when he was younger, a younger man, 50 years ago, he had a dream of handwriting a copy of the Bible. What you're seeing him showing Pope Francis here is the product. Because in the 1990s, uh, a monastery in America wanted to fire up the imagination of the world for the 21st century by giving it a handwritten copy of the Bible, the first handwritten copy in 500 years. And Donald Jackson was the man that they asked to take charge of it. The amazing uh, work is, uh, is available. There are several copies made and multiple copies have been made electronically, of course. Um, here's just one image uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the text. It includes these amazing illuminations which are like a commentary on the text. I've said before to the congregation here, and you will have, if you remember, you'll remember me saying it perhaps, that he, he used gold leaf wherever he was seeking to depict divinity. And so the text has got this amazing richness. He used old techniques. Uh, they made their own brushes and paints. Uh, it's extraordinary. They used computers to make sure they had the text in the right places on the on the vellum parchment that they used. And it, it is a, an inspiring text. He wanted something that would actually uh, be there, as it were, the labor of love to uh, communicate the message of Jesus. But uh, uh, the, the message of Jesus inspires gratitudes in acts of all kinds of ways. And I'm mentioning this one because I've mentioned a couple of singers so far and their songs and, and there are so many singers and songs that share the Christian message that I couldn't uh, fall and settle on any one of them. But you will know, I'm sure, that there are many well-known singers who began in church choirs. They started to sing there because the Christian message comes with song, as you'll see on uh, the first Sunday in Advent when we gather. So... Here we have this uh, creativity surging forward. And it's not just in the arts, it's also in the sciences. This is the cover of a book called The Language of God. Uh, You may not have heard of uh, uh, Francis Collins, the author here. But you'll have heard of the kind of influence of genetics and the human genome on our medical world. I was talking to a scientist uh, about the way our medicines had had, uh, been developing And he was just saying how they've really taken off since the human genome was mapped. Francis Collins was the scientist in charge of the 1,200 scientists involved in mapping the human genome. And when when he finished, 
he saw the, in the in the um, the formula, the DNA formula that uh, is part of our our human genetics, is part of the way God has worked in history, and so not only in the creative world of art and music, and so, but also in the scientific world, there is a Christian presence. This is part of our human response to God's generosity to us, to offer Him ourselves, just like the Corinthians were told that the Macedonians had done. They offered not just their money, but their their whole selves. And so we see people seeking to do this. This is what we call Christian worship. It's not just gathering uh, virtually or even literally uh, to consider what the Bible says, although it includes that, but it's going out day by day with the generosity that God has shown us for other people. The Bible says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So we seek to give expression to the worthiness of our God. Alexander McLaren says this, The only recompense that we can make for the unspeakable gift is to receive it with thanks unto God and the yielding up of our hearts unto him. The unspeakable gift given for you, given for me. We yield our hearts. What else would you do? Amen. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, We are at a loss for words. It is a gift unspeakable. Here in his love, not that we loved you, but that while we were still helpless, you loved us and gave your son to be the propitiation for our sins. Your love revealed through the unspeakable gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a world of strained relationships, hurting families, political polarity, racial and religious tensions. It is with hungry hearts we bow in adoration of our selfless Saviour. Forgive our sin, cleanse us wholly, and fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. Lord, please increase our capacity this NIDOC week in Australia to humble ourselves and listen afresh to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We pray that Australian churches, communities and governments at all levels would hear the voices of the First Nations peoples and help shape harmonious and enduring reconciliation in our land. Worldwide, we have been reminded by acts of violence that hatred finds easy lodgment in the human heart. We pray for those who have experienced trauma and loss as a result of such evil in France and Austria. Remind us anew that the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. Here in Melbourne, we've had an encouraging week of diminishing rates of COVID infections and death. We're grateful for the high level of civic compliance with measures that contain the virus Help us all not to be complacent, but re-engage safely into activities and work enterprises that enable people to restore their livelihoods. We pray for people experiencing stress in their relationships as a result of COVID's impact on home and family routines and finances. Help us to hear again the words of Jesus to the young lawyer who asked, Who is my neighbour? Strengthen us to do the same as the Samaritan. Where COVID infections are rising and winter approaches, and also in those poorer countries of the Southern Hemisphere where the rates of infections remain high and resources are meager, we pray for wisdom for decision makers and resources for frontline workers so that care of infected people will be well orchestrated and safely implemented. We pray for families who have lost loved ones in the Aegean earthquake and in the Armenian-Azerbaijan war. 
We ask that China would change her policy on human rights and for wise choices by our own politicians in the face of trade difficulties with China. We pray for the USA. We ask especially for your blessing on the President-elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. We pray that all court challenges will be fairly and speedily resolved and that Donald Trump and Mike Pence will become gracious in defeat and participate in the healing of the divisions in America. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. This week, as we remember the devastating consequences of war, have compassion on every wounded and grieving family. May the risen Lord Jesus Christ bring healing and hope as we rest our souls in him. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us, this week, make sure that our lives give thanks to God for his priceless gift. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest with you and remain with you and with those whom you love today and always. <laughs>